All right, this is a very grand title that I was given, and I'm going to disappoint many of you by not dwelling on some of these topics as I go through. What I'd like to do is talk about these are three key aspects of our adaptation. How do you get there? What do you eat when you get there? And how smart are you about doing it? And these are things that we focus on when we study human evolution. And I'm going to talk about some of them. Mostly I'm going to talk about walking on two feet. Maybe that's just because what I do. But I think by the end of this, I hope you'll understand why I'm pitching this the way they am. So what I'm going to do is start by sort of setting the stage, as others have, about what we knew before Lucy entered the scene, what Lucy taught us in terms of evidence and in terms of the questions that we take to the fossil record, and then later what we're learning now in the last 50 years about how some of these things fit together. So going back to Tong was 100 years ago. 50 years before Lucy. We're going back 50 years. That's another 50 years. It's amazing to me. I've just been, I don't know, reeling in this, I guess, this year. And Tong was important because it set what I thought of, this is the beginning of what I think is our modern understanding of how our origins went. You know, humans, we're smart. We have culture and big brains and language and all these things. And so prior to the discovery of the Tong skull, naturally that would have what initially set us apart from our eight forebears, and that must when the beginning of the story. But of course, this little skull didn't have a very much larger or fancier brain than we see in modern great apes, maybe a little bit. But its face and teeth were very different, suggesting that they had different dietary adaptations. And importantly, this little skull would have sat on top of the spinal column, not in front of it. So Dart, or Dart recognized that this must be bipedal. So Robert Broom and later John Robin and so forth went crawling around and looked these other caves, apparently scantily clad, um, and tried to find more evidence of how these creatures may have moved around. And particularly at the site of Sturkfontein, they, they found a series of postcranial elements. These are all isolated. This is all of them that were known before Lucy except for one. Here's a picture of Robert Broom holding a block of breccia. These fossils come out of these caves and basically bricks that have to be prepared off them. It's crazy. This became prepared to be a beautiful partial skeleton called STS-14. But this collection of fossils was it. This is all we knew. But it was still pretty good. We have bits of a near a shoulder, an upper arm, a lower arm, a hand, a spine, a pelvis, and knees. It was pretty good. And we can see from these fossils that that vertebral column was long and flexible and would have been capable of curvatures that we have that allow us to stand fully upright and not be hunched over. The pelvis was low and wide and would have been able to help us balance over one foot at a time when we're walking on two feet. We're knock kneed. I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment that's a little bit better. And so we knew that these things were bipedal. Um, the trick is, of course, this is not the best picture of Sturkfontein. This is Ron Clark, who is working there uh, much more recently. These are caves. Stuff falls in the caves. It's very difficult to date them. And at the time, the other animals in the cave, we thought this, these deposits were about 2 million years old. So we had 2 million year old hominids that were walking on two feet, weren't particularly brainy, and ate some weird stuff. Well, enter the stage. 50 years goes by, enter Lucy. And Lucy is remarkable, as we're hearing all day, for a number of things. But let's do, what does her skeleton tell us? Well, Lucy and her relatives, we know we're not kneed. Our thighs angle in, our femur bone from the thigh angles in, so we get our center of gravity over one foot at a time, which is useful so we don't fall over. And Lucy also would have a spine with curvatures that would have enabled her to stand fully upright, so this wasn't sort of shuffling ape kind of thing. And we had that low, wide pelvis that's very human-like. And this inspired a lot of really outstanding biomechanical analysis to understand these features by Owen Lovejoy and his colleagues. So that was all pretty neat. But of course, what was amazing about Lucy is she was so complete. One individual with all these parts from the same person. And that gave us a really tremendous opportunity to look at how these different parts of the body were related to one another, what were their proportions, and began to give us a glimpse into an actual individual that would have lived a long time ago. Because the other remarkable thing about Lucy is she was so old. 
over three million years. And East Africa has the advantage of having this beautiful layer cake stratigraphy where you can get datable volcanic ashes and crud and fossils building up and you can tell exactly how old all of this is. So we have a complete individual that was really old and this was amazing. What was even more amazing is Don and his team went back just one year later and found a bunch more at the 333 site. We refer to this as the first family. These are a collection of bones from most parts of the body, from young individuals, old individuals, males, females. So we not only had a picture of one individual that lived this long ago, but of a population. We could look at variation and growth and other kinds of remarkable things. And this was so exciting, it spurned a tremendous amount of scientific discovery and interest. And it spurred them out of debate because we're paleoanthropologists and we can disagree about things. But we get a much better idea about what Lucy and her kin may have been like. And this is three more recent reconstructions. And so we knew that Lucy, and I'll just say Lucy, that's easier, was bipedal, walked on two feet. There were some bones of the toes from this collection suggested she would have had a fairly human-like foot and standing upright. But she did have those bigger, longer arms and those longer curved fingers and toes. And we now know slightly higher set to her shoulders. And that sparked the debate that was mentioned earlier about what the importance of those was. Were they so well adapted to be on the ground? And sure, the arms are a little bit bigger and so forth, but not nearly as much as we see as an ape ancestor. So selection would have clearly been moving away from having these animals be good in the trees to being good on the ground. Or did they keep these ape-like features that are useful for climbing for a reason? Spoil alert, the debate isn't solved 50 years later. We're still working on it. But the important thing about this debate was it's shaped the way we've looked at the Hadar fossils. It shapes the way we look at every single early hominin fossil that's been published since. Pick up a paper that's been published in the last few years and how much tree climbing was there is often very central to this debate. And that's really important. And back when Lucy was found, we also were wondering, well, what about gait where they kind of also, if they're still in the trees, maybe they weren't really as proficient at walking on the ground as we are. And these questions have been with us for a long time. And what I'd like to do is take you through some of the evidence that have refined some of that interpretation, although clearly not answered it. Um, we all have opinions. I have opinions. That's all right. Um, but one of the important discoveries came just a few years later. You've seen mention of these footprints in Tanzania at another Afrensis site found by Mary Leakey and her team. And they look basically for all the world like the kind of footprints that we would make in the sand today. Um, they showed that the big toe is in line with the rest of the digits, and they're walking on two feet, rather than having that big old grasping big toe, which is super important for big animals like great apes to climb around in the trees and support themselves on multiple branches. Lucy had given that up, and that's a really handy thing. So we know that bipedality was extremely important for the survival and reproductive success of Afarensis. But there's still some debate. The footprints are old. They're not perfectly preserved. And um, there was wonder about whether maybe the feet was sort of flexible in the middle, like the orangutans. You can grab onto the trees a little bit better. Um, were they really specialized? And new fossils have refined our understanding of this. And one I'd like to highlight was found by Don and Bill and their team when they went back to the hot air starting after the 90s. And that's a small bone called a metatarsal. It's from the middle of your foot. And this little metatarsal looks basically just like yours or mine. And it showed that not only did Lucy have her big toe lined up with the rest of her digits, she had an arch in her foot. And that arch gives you a little bit of spring in your step or shock absorption. But importantly, all the muscles that used to be used for grasping are lined up in support of this arch so that when you lift your heels off, you get a strong propulsive lever. It doesn't bend in the middle like an ape would. And this makes a very efficient, human-like way of walking around the ground possible. And its new fossils refining this are showing us that selection on being good and walking on the ground was more important for shaping that foot than being able to grab onto the branches, which would be really useful, especially if you're a female who's probably holding an infant most of the time when they're climbing in the trees. Not saying they didn't climb, just saying that what's shaping the skeleton was very clearly very human-like. And this suggests a very human-like gait rather than some sort of working on it halfway between ape and human kind of a way. 
Another thing we now understand about Lucy that we didn't soon after she was found is the shape of the rib cage. Ribs are small and they break and they're really hard to find. Um, but when you look at the human compared to this ape here, you see we have this barrel shaped rib cage, whereas the, the ape has this triangular rib shade that reaches all the way down to its really long pelvis, and this makes that whole torso stiff, which is great for the great ape because it provides a stiff platform to anchor those muscles of the upper limbs that allow you to pull yourself around in trees. We, on the other hand, along with our long lower back and short pelvis, have a waist. And we can swivel our hips and walk very biomechanically efficiently. It's a very distinctive efficiency we have in our gait. So what about Lucy? Well, soon after Lucy and the first family were found, there, Lucy had some ribs, but they were kind of broken up. So this was really the best reconstruction we had about what Lucy's body form might have been like. And it's very ape-like. And that suggests maybe, you know, even stronger climbing adaptations were retained in Lucy. That's possible. But in addition to locomotion, this reconstruction has other potential biological consequences. Great apes have this big pot belly, if you like to think of it. They have a very long digestive tract. They can take a long time passing through, through, food through to get a lot of nutrients out of vegetation. We don't have that. And so this would have suggested that go from something like Lucy to something like us would have revolved shrinking the size of the digestive tract. And there was a very influential hypothesis that suggested rather than putting all the energy into building your gut, you used it to help fuel the large brain, which also shows up with Homo. But we have new fossils. One of which was really important is a beautiful new afarensis skeleton found by Johannes Haile Selassie that has nearly complete ribs. There's also a more recent species from South Africa called Sadiba that has reasonably complete ribs. And it turns out, pardon the graph, if you measure the curvature of the ribs, it says something about the rib cage. You can see the human with a barrel shape at the top. And when you look at the graph, you can see humans have much more curved ribs up near the top of the rib cage. And when we plot on our fossils, lo and behold, very human-like. So this gives us a better picture of what Lucy's body build would have been and something about her biology. This is probably a somewhat more recent, re realistic reconstruction in terms of body form. So here's an animal that may have had the big, strong upper limbs and high shoulders and so forth, but would have had a human-like torso with a waist, with an arch in her foot. And so she would have been capable of basically very effective and very efficient bipedal locomotion, not something halfway to homo. She was really good at walking on the ground. Maybe she still went in trees and that was still important, absolutely. But whatever she had to do, she could do well enough having given up that grasping big toe and made all these other modifications. And that's a rather different way we're thinking about afarensis thanks to the new fossils that have been added to um, our understanding. And there are other new discoveries here too, but I'll get yelled at by Chris if I go too long. So um, back to diet. So the sort of operating hypothesis when you look at textbooks and has really governed a lot of what we think is you have these savanna environments and um, there's something about diet here. Look at the face of this 444 skull. It has massive teeth and jaws. It has massive chewing muscles. These things could chew all kinds of tough foods. Great apes tend to specialize on ripe fruits, which are delicious and nutritious, but they grow on trees. And if you're living in a place that don't have a lot of fruiting trees nearby, you can make do with whatever you eat, whatever you find in the savanna. And with these big teeth and jaws, they were able to eat not just fruits, but tough to chew things, maybe tubers, seeds, nuts. Jess Thompson will give you a much better picture of that later today. But in pursuit of these foods, the idea goes, these hominids start venturing further and further away from the trees, and that's selected for bipedal gait to become more efficient. So that's basically the idea is, did diet lead towards bipedality? And we actually have some new insights on this, or at least some new questions, I would say, about how this goes. And that is because no longer is Lucy the oldest game in town. We now have a species that dates back to a million years before Lucy showed up herself. It's called Australopithecus animensis. It's found from a number of sites throughout Eastern Africa, as is Afarensis now. And 
The neat thing about Afarensis and Anamensis are when you line up these, these different sites, there's an age graded series of them and we seem to see changes through time and they seem to be basically, broadly speaking, an evolving lineage. And when you compare, for example, the jaws of the early Anamensis with the later Afarensis, what you see is Afarensis has shrunk the front of its jaws, make it a more V-shape, it's got a more vertical chin. I'm very, very general here. But basically, this allows you to generate and resist higher chewing forces. You can chew better, tougher things at Afarensis than at Anamensis. We also know that the enamel caps in the teeth of Afarensis are thicker, which lets you to eat tougher foods to avoid wearing down or grit that happens to be around those foods if they're on the ground. And we know, looking at the chemical signatures of the isotopes that reflect the foods that they ate, Afarensis was eating all kinds of things rather than being restricted to the tree-based resources that um, Anamensis was seemed to be specializing in. So we seem to see some sort of dietary change throughout the first million years of Australopithecus evolution. Okay, so what does that have to do with locomotion? Do we see bipedality changing over time? Well, we don't have that many postcranial fossils, but we do have a leg bone from 4.2 million years ago. It's the tibia, it's the bone in your lower leg. And when you look at a chimpanzee, you'll see that lower leg bone is angled in. And what this, let the chimpanzee do is turn its feet inward towards a branch when it's climbing, and that's very useful. You or I have our knee right over our foot. Our tibia is vertical, and this allows you to keep your center of gravity over one foot at a time is what you have to do when you're walking or running on only two feet. So if you look at the tibia of a chimpanzee, you'll see an angle. And if you look at the tibia of an anamensis, just like afarensis and every hominid that comes after it, straight up and down just like ours. So it seems that bipedality may have been well established 4.2 million years ago, and there was certainly some dietary change with the origin of anamensis as well, but the diet continued to change. So it may be that rather than diet driving selection for locomotion, it may be that animals that were good at walking around in these savanna environments were able to travel and find and exploit these resources that then led to selection for these different dietary diversity. And when we look at later Australopiths, we see a lots of different dietary adaptations, but for the most part, postcranially, they're not wildly different. So it may be that rather than diet driving locomotion, locomation may have facilitated this dietary selection that shaped this radiation of Australopiths that we have. We're not sure of this. This is all about questions. And it goes back to Lucy. Because Lucy not only taught us things about these early ancestors, Lucy taught us new ways to think about early human evolution. How important were trees for moving in? What was the relationship between diet and locomotion? And in science, to get the right answers, you have to ask the right questions. And so Lucy gave us new questions which are continuing to being refined. Some are better answered, some we're still debating. That's great. But Lucy really shaped the way we study early human evolution and the kinds of questions we take to the fossil record. Those questions are still evolving and changing in addition to the facts that we know, the questions and approaches we have um, are changing as well. So I'd just like to thank Lucy for her contributions. Um, oh, and Don for finding her and all of that. That's all great. But she's a... <laughs> She's, um, Lucy's been an inspiration to me, I'm sure to most of my colleagues sitting here and many of you listening to this wonderful symposium today. Um, it's been tremendous and I'd like to thank the staff and the faculty and, of Institute of Human Origins and ASU for having us. And I can't leave without thanking the late, great Bill Kimball, one of my best friends and mentors. He taught me much of what I know and a lot of his work underlies everything that you're hearing about today. And importantly for me, 30 years ago this year, Bill's the one who invited me to work on Lucy and the Hadar fossils. And so I can't thank Bill enough. And of course, there's lots of people and institutions that made everything possible. And I'd really like to thank all of you for listening today. And I hope you're having as much fun as I am. So thank you very much. I'm going to sit down and enjoy the rest of this wonderful celebration. Thank you.